Historians have long noticed the remarkable similarities between the world's major religions. So today we're going to drill down just a little bit and ask ourselves why that is and whether or not the whole human race is sharing a collective memory of something really important. Visiting Machu Picchu down in South America was always one of the biggest items on my personal bucket list because, well, I've always found the Inca Empire really, really fascinating. I mean, here was this stunning kingdom that at its peak was in some ways comparable to the Roman Empire, and they built it without the use of a written alphabet and even without the use of the wheel. So, a few years back, I was working in the city of Lima, Peru, and I finally got my chance to travel up to the city of Cuzco. And from there, I made my way out into the Andes, into the ancient world of the Incas. And I've got to tell you, this is one of those things you really can't experience through books or pictures. Because first of all, the physical setting for these ancient ruins is absolutely stunning. I'm talking storybook beautiful. And then secondly, the cities themselves, they're nothing short of amazing. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you will recognize a picture of Machu Picchu because it's one of the most photographed spots anywhere on the planet. Scholars believe it was built as an estate for the great Inca emperor Pachacuti, built in the early 15th century. So the city is roughly 600 years old now, and except for the wooden roofs that used to cover the buildings, it's still pretty much intact. Now, if you're going to visit Machu Picchu, you really want to get to these ruins before sunrise, because the whole city is situated around the practice of sun worship, the rising of the sun. The Inca sun god was named Inti, and there's a stone at the top of the city known as the Intihuatana, or the hitching post of the sun. There's also a solar temple just down the hill, and the whole city was positioned to line up with the sun on the winter solstice, which takes place in June down there because they're in the southern hemisphere. At the winter solstice, the days are getting shorter, and it looks like their sun god is wandering away from his people. In the south, the sun keeps moving north, so once a year, the Incas would celebrate the winter solstice and perform rituals to convince this sun god, Inti, to come back in their direction. Now, in the solar observatory just down the hill from the hitching post of the sun, there was a mark on a stone right by a window. And when the sun was at its lowest point in the sky, the patch of light from the window frame would line up with that mark and the priests of the sun god would know for sure that it was the very moment of the solstice. And of course, then they could inform the people that Inti had heard all their petitions and he'd be coming back. Now, what I find fascinating is the way that most ancient cultures on this planet have something similar. If you head to the other side of the world and visit the Boyne Valley of Ireland, you'll find ancient passage tombs that date back thousands of years. And maybe the most famous of these tombs is the one found at Newgrange, which appears to be more of an astronomical structure than a grave, because on the winter solstice, when the sun sits low in the sky, a beam of light suddenly pierces through to the very center of the structure and lights up the back wall. And again, this is what you find with a lot of ancient cultures, a fascination with the sun, the moon, the stars, and the seasons. Now, I know we like to think that people in the distant past worshiped the sun because they were ignorant and superstitious. But the picture that emerges out of the ancient world is not quite that easy. It turns out that most of these cultures were no more ignorant than we are, and in some ways they were surprisingly sophisticated. The night sky provided them with a very detailed calendar, and they could mark the passage of time and seasonal cycles with remarkable precision. Somehow, some of these ancient cultures actually knew things about astronomy that you and I didn't figure out until the 20th century. For example, the ancient Egyptians revered the dog star Sirius because when it appeared on the horizon right before sunrise, it meant the Nile was about to flood. 
and it was time to get off the lowlands. And somehow, apparently, the Egyptians also knew that Sirius was actually a star system. It had more than one star. And that's something we didn't notice till the middle of the 20th century. The same was true of the Dogon tribe some 2,000 miles south of Egypt in modern-day Mali. They knew it, too. And according to some sources, this is disputed, but some sources say the Dogons apparently also knew that Saturn had rings. And there's just enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that maybe they did. So, I know we have this assumption that our high-tech age is far more sophisticated than the people who came before us, but I would guess that your average ancient human had a far better understanding of the night sky than you or I do. And it turns out that very few ancient people actually thought that the sun, the moon, or the planets, the stars, were gods. They thought of these things more like a point of contact with the spirit world, kind of like, I don't know, the payphone of the universe. A lot of ancient cultures believed that the cosmos started out as a non-material place. It was actually, they said, made out of thoughts. And then slowly over time, those thoughts condensed into gases and finally physical matter, which now makes up the world that you and I live in. So to the ancient pagan mind, the universe was split into these two realms of being. You had the great mind of the cosmos, the spiritual world, and then you had down here this imperfect world that we live in. Now, most of the time, people give Plato a lot of credit for this idea. We even call it Greek dualism. But in reality, this system of thinking dates back a lot further than his famous school of Athens. The Greeks actually revered an ancient Egyptian philosopher by the name of Thoth. The man, they said, invented the art of writing. Eventually, Thoth was deified as an Egyptian god, and the Greeks renamed him Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes the Great Times Three. And it was from this fountain of ancient knowledge from Egypt that most of the world's spiritualism and dualism made its way into our thinking. So we can give Plato high marks for systematizing it, but not for inventing it. It didn't originate with him. So, what we had in the ancient world was a dualistic universe. The higher realm of disembodied spirits, the gods, if you will, and then the lower realm of physical existence. Now, in Greek culture, if you were a good philosopher, you wanted to escape the limitations of a physical life and rise up to the spirit world where you could go and join the great cosmic mind. This is what you find in Plato's account of the death of Socrates, who tells his students as he sits on death row not to feel bad about his impending death because he's about to achieve the highest goal of a philosopher, total release from this imperfect physical world. But I digress, and I want to get back to this business about the sun god. The Egyptians called him Ra. The Incas called him Inti. The Romans called him Sol Invictus, or the Invincible Sun. But very few of these people actually thought the sun itself was a literal deity. It was more like a point of contact, a portal through which the spirit world could communicate with the human race and exert its influence on this planet. Maybe the best analogy would be a radio or TV set. When you and I watch the evening news, it's not really the TV that's doing all the talking. It's just a medium, if you'll pardon a pun, a medium through which a news anchor can talk to you. The sun would be that medium of communication for a deity who lived out there somewhere in the spirit world. And all those stories, the mythology of the Greeks, the Romans, the Norse, the Celts, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Incas, well, they didn't really believe that these were literal historical accounts. They were metaphors, meant to teach important lessons about how they thought the universe was structured and how human beings should relate to each other and what might constitute a good life. Now, all over the world we have different mythologies with different names. But it's absolutely remarkable how similar all the stories are. It's almost as if the whole human race shares a common set of information, as if at some point in the very distant past we were all telling the same story. Then over time, as we went our separate ways and spread across the face of the planet, those stories changed just a little bit. And it created the natural diversification that comes with time and distance. 
It's kind of the way it is with human languages. Once upon a time, for example, Dutch and English were very, very close, almost indistinguishable, because both were Germanic languages in their origin. But then with time and distance, they went their separate ways, and today they sound to us like separate languages. Look at them closely, though, and you can see they share a common root. The same appears to be true of the world's mythology. The various gods seem to line up with each other across any number of cultures, and the stories appear to suggest that we all share a common past. Now, I've got to take a super quick break, but in a moment I want to show you something else that all these ancient cultures had in common, and I promise this is going to give you a lot to think about. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. It's a pretty common theory that most of the world's ancient cultures moved away from polytheism, the worship of many gods, to monotheism, the worship of one god. And it's a pretty good theory in a lot of ways. For example, the Greek philosopher Xenophanes, who lived some 500 years before Christ, well, he became embarrassed by the behavior of his Greek gods. We don't have a lot of his writings, but the few fragments we do have tell an interesting story. This comes from fragment B11, just in case you're ever motivated to go and look it up. He says, Homer and Hesiod have attributed to the gods all sorts of things that are matters of reproach and censure among men, theft, adultery, and mutual deception. So in other words, Xenophanes is challenging the idea that gods should be exhibiting such horrible behavior. And he suggests that maybe the Greeks and other cultures have been actually inventing gods in their own image, that maybe these gods are nothing but the creation of the human imagination. And then he suggests that worshiping one god makes a lot more sense. So historically there is this slow movement away from many gods to one god, and the religious historians often give Abraham and the Hebrews credit for being the first. But what I find interesting is the fact that most ancient cultures, no matter how many gods they worshipped, still appeared to have the idea that there must be one supreme being who reigns above all other gods. The rest of the pantheon was simply a collection of emanations coming from this one supreme being, or lesser gods who somehow answer to this one true supreme being. Now, if that's the case, it's possible that the worship of many gods was actually a deterioration an ancient move away from a more ancient religion that had a one true creator. What happened is that the ancient cultures, as they studied the heavens, started to associate the sun, moon, and planets with lesser deities, and then in time they abandoned the one true God. Personally, I believe that we didn't all come from different starting points. We all branched out from the same starting point. So, now let's get back to the Incas, because Machu Picchu isn't the only place the Incas acknowledged the winter solstice. The capital of Pachacuti's empire was Cusco, a city that sits up in the mountains above 11,000 feet. Today the city looks like a Spanish colony, but if you look at the bottoms of some of the buildings, you'll notice the foundations look different from the tops. That's because the Spanish actually put their buildings on Inca foundations, but the original design of the city was not Spanish, it was Inca. This was the place where Pachacuti ruled his incredible empire, made up of four provinces spread across the backbone of South America. And to this day, in the month of June, 
you can witness the celebration of something called Inti Raimi, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's this ancient festival connected with the winter solstice. And at one point in the festivities, the crowd makes its way to the ancient fortress of Sacsayhuaman, just outside of town. And one of the things they do when they get there is sacrifice a llama. Now today they don't actually kill an animal, not anymore. They just go through the motions. But in the past, they would cut the heart out of the llama and present it to the sun god. And if all went well, the sun would quit wandering north and the days would start getting longer. And I guess I find this fascinating because this is also something that I find in almost every culture on the face of the planet. This idea of making peace with the gods through sacrifice. Where did that come from? And why is it so incredibly present in the records of our collective human past? If you go back to the Shang Dynasty of ancient China, an era that started some six or seven hundred years before Christ, you find some of these same elements. They had one supreme god by the name of Shang Di. And once a year, I could be wrong, but I believe it was at the winter solstice, once a year, the emperor would sacrifice a bull to the one supreme god at the Temple of Heaven. It was a ritual that persisted right up to the 20th century. And what's kind of interesting is the fact that archaeologists do not find any statues of this Shang Di. So we suspect that nobody ever made any. And if they didn't, that would be something they had in common with the Hebrews, who actually forbid the use of statues to represent their God. And the Hebrews also sacrificed a bull to the one true God, as well as goats and lambs. And from what I can tell, the worshipers of Shang Di also offered sheep. So we have the same sacrificial animals being used to worship a supreme God in two different cultures, in two different places. Maybe that's a coincidence. I mean, it could be. But the more you look at this, the less a coincidence seems likely. Among the Greeks and the Romans, there was something known as the mystery schools, byproducts of the ancient system of dualism that we mentioned a few minutes ago. The teachings of these mystery schools were a carefully guarded secret, and you had to be an initiate, a member of the group, to learn about them. About the same time that Christianity was starting to take root in the Roman Empire, one of these ancient mystery cults practiced something known as the Torobolium. If you listen, it's got the word Taurus in it, which is Latin for bull. And what happened during the Torobolium is a priest of the great mother of the gods would climb down into a pit, and they would cover the pit with a wooden grate. Then they would lead a bull on top of that grate and slaughter it so that the blood ran down into the pit and covered the priest. We actually still have a description of this ritual from a 4th century Christian named Prudentius who witnessed it. He writes, the high priest, you know, goes down into a trench dug deep in the ground to be made holy. Above him they lay planks to make a stage. When the beast for sacrifice has been stationed here, they cut his breast open with a consecrated hunting spear, and the great wound disgorges a stream of hot blood, pouring on the plank bridge below a streaming river which spreads billowing out. Then, through the many ways afforded by the thousand chinks, it passes in a shower, dripping a foul rain, and the priest in the pit below catches it, holding his filthy head to meet every drop and getting his robe and his whole body covered with corruption. It was nasty, and obviously Prudentius didn't care for it. But again, you have the idea of sacrifice, that somehow an animal needs to die to make things right. So where in the world did we get this idea, and why is it so incredibly pervasive? I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Here in the Western world, the story of sacrifice that most of us are familiar with comes from the pages of the Bible. And a significant portion of the Old Testament deals with that specific phenomenon. There's an incredible level of detail, and this is well worth your time reading. 
But maybe today, let's go back to the root of the concept and look at what the Bible says is the reason that sacrifice started. Over in the book of Genesis, we have the story of the fall, the fatal moment when human beings decided to turn their backs on the Creator and chart their own course in this world. And calling that a fatal moment is very appropriate because the end result, when you separate yourself from the only source of life in the universe, well, that would be death. Well, let's just read a little bit of the story. This comes from Genesis chapter 2. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die." Now, the key message there is that not all knowledge is worth pursuing. Some things in this universe are dangerous, and the exercise of free will can get you into trouble. Human beings were free in the beginning to make their own decisions, right out of the gate. But just in case, God put a guardrail around certain experiences that would take us in the wrong direction. We were perfectly free to climb over that guardrail because God does not force the human conscience. But at the same time, He warned that there would be drastic penalties if we did it. If you separate yourself from the living God, He said, the consequence would be death. So, from the moment the human race decided to go its own way, something fundamental about our nature changed. We began to operate from the perspective of self, and the loving character of God got harder and harder to find just by watching people live. We were made in the image of God, which means that the human race was intended as a showcase of God's goodness. But now, after the fall, we exhibited something else, a selfish nature, and our lives became a lie about the nature of the one who made us. You and I today are essentially selfish, and our lives do not suggest we were made by a God of love. The, the image of the Creator is barely discernible in the human race. And, and a God of love cannot just let pain and suffering go on indefinitely, or it might suggest that God is not love and that the universe He made is a horrible place. And I know we, we don't like to think of a God who judges, but if we're really honest, how many of us could really pledge allegiance to a God who didn't judge? We absolutely want Him to judge the wickedness of other people. We just don't want Him to deal with us. There's still a sense in which we understand that something is completely out of whack with all of us. Millions of books have been written trying to figure out what's wrong with humanity. Why are we so fatally flawed? Why do we keep doing the wrong thing over and over and over, generation after generation? And, and why are we so painfully aware of our shortcomings? By rights, a loving and just God should just wipe the human race out, remove us from His perfect universe. And if we're really honest, we would admit we deserve it. And yet here we are, still existing, with the specter of death hanging ominously over every one of our lives. And it's at this juncture that we find the notion of sacrifice showing up for the very first time. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. After the fall, we were no longer a perfect representation of God's character, and this horrible imperfection was something that had to be covered. Either that, or we had to be destroyed. And here's what I want you to notice. The covering was made by God because there was no way we could fix this problem we created. We were already fundamentally flawed, too far gone. And the other thing I want you to notice, the coverings were made by skin. And that meant something had to give its life. Now, in all the pagan cultures of the world, this story got twisted to make God look like a bloodthirsty tyrant who demands blood in order to turn off his hatred for us. But that's not the way it's taught in the Bible, not even close. What this book teaches is that God made the ultimate sacrifice, and all those sacrificial animals were merely symbols that pointed forward to a solution that only God could come up with. That solution was the Incarnation. God became one of us, and He lived the perfect life, the only life that has ever perfectly reflected the real nature of God. And then He took our consequences on Himself. I'll be right back after this. 
Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Let me get the old bifocals on because I want to read you something out of the book of Hebrews. This is really interesting. You need to pay attention to it. It's pertinent to this whole idea of where sacrifice comes from. You'll find this in Hebrews chapter 10, where the Bible says, But in those sacrifices, we're talking animal sacrifices here, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Now I hope you caught that, because this is really critical. Not one sacrificial animal ever actually paid for anything. They didn't solve the sin problem. The real sacrifice in this story is not being made by us. That's all symbolic. God makes the real sacrifice. The animals were just this painful reminder of how serious our situation is, how dire it is, and how much God is willing to sacrifice to save us from a fate that we frankly brought on ourselves. So why do we have this universal concept of sin and guilt? Why is it found in all these cultures? Why is the phenomenon of sacrifice found all over the planet? Is it possible that it all comes back to this? That maybe we all came from a common root somewhere in the very distant past? Is this the real story of what actually happened? Is it possible that human beings have distorted this account and turned it into a monstrosity over the centuries? Here's what I want to suggest. I submit that maybe it's time to just brush aside all of the superstition. And maybe it's time for all of us to go back to the very beginning, the account of where this all started, and ask ourselves, what do we all have in common? Why do we all seem to share a common history, a common root, a common story? Why do we all seem to be remembering the very same thing? I think if you get to the bottom of that question, you might be remarkably surprised by what you find and what you discover about living an authentic life. Mm -hmm.